Welcome. Thanks for your patience. We now have the slides up and going. Good afternoon. I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far and enjoying being together here in San Diego. And for those of you online, enjoying being, to being together in our virtual conference space. I am particularly excited to be here this afternoon for one of AERA's most important events, the Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecture. The Wallace Lecture, in alignment of, with the goal of the foundation in affecting meaningful change in the lives of young people, focuses on improvement in educational practice in American primary and secondary schools with a special focus on equity. And this is why I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for this important lecture, someone whose life work centers on creating transformative educational change, someone who approaches the world with an undeniable urgency to create high quality education for those who need it most, someone who is deeply committed to policies and practices that create an equitable education landscape for all. Our distinguished speaker today, Amanda Datnow, is Professor and Chancellor's Associate Endowed Chair of the Department of Education Studies and Associate Dean of the Division of Social Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. So she's here in her home city. Amanda is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research focuses on education reform and policy, especially with respect to issues of equity and the professional lives of educators. Over the past decade, she has conducted numerous studies examining the use of data for instructional improvement, teacher collaboration, and leadership. And she's also engaged in research practice partnerships with local districts and communities across the globe. Amanda is the author of eight books, including her most recent work, Professional Collaboration with Purpose, Teacher Learning for Equity and Excellence, and she's published over 50 peer reviewed journal articles. Amanda's work has been widely supported, including funding by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the US Department of Education, which is a testament, I think, to the relevance and importance of her work. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Amanda Detnow. Thank you so much, Naila. I'm honored to be here today and to welcome you to San Diego. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, students and colleagues and mentors, and also my mom who's never heard me give a talk before. And my husband has heard me give this talk way too many times before in the last few weeks. When you were young, how many of you had education researcher as one of your top career goals? There's, I thought there might be at least one, but, but no, none. So it's, it's not usually on the list of occupations that young people mention when asked about their future. Almost no one grows up knowing what educational research is or wanting to be an education researcher. More likely, it is a profession that people come to in an effort to address abiding concerns in the field of education with the hopes that their research can make a difference. My own journey was no exception. Deeply troubled by the ways in which schools reproduce inequalities for low-income students and students of color, I set out on a path to conduct research on educational reform efforts that were aimed at achieving equity. It has now been 30 years since I began asking, what are the equity questions here? I am struck by both how much and how little has changed in this period. On the one hand, I'm despondent that equity-based reforms that seemed so sensible years ago have yet to be implemented on a broad scale. On the other hand, I see signs of hope and growing recognition among researchers, policymakers, and educators that equity must be a central focus of the work that we do. It's becoming increasingly clear that education systems need to be reimagined to serve all students well, and particularly those who have been marginalized due to their race, culture, language, gender, and or sexual identity. This transformational work will take time and the students in our schools and educators in our schools today cannot wait. We must simultaneously find ways to improve their experiences today while redesigning systems for the future. In this lecture, I'll reflect on what I've learned by asking equity questions in studies of school reform and consider what a path forward might look like for our field. Take a moment to reflect on the wise words of author Bell Hooks. We must ask critical questions, as Bell Hooks says, 
But if we only provide critiques, we take away hope and empowerment. She states, hopefulness empowers us to continue our work for justice, even as the forces of injustice may grain, gain greater power for a time. My journey into educational research began in the late 1980s as an undergraduate in Hugh Bud Mian's Sociology of Education course at UC San Diego. Having studied life inside classrooms to uncover the constitutive actions that led to inequalities, Bud enlightened me to the importance of looking closely at the lived experiences of students and educators. I was incredibly fortunate that he introduced me to the field of educational research and invited me to join him, Lee Hubbard, and others on a study of AVID, a now well-known college preparatory program aimed at untracking students who show academic promise. At that time, AVID students were primarily low-income students, mostly students of color who were underrepresented in college preparatory classes and in universities. We studied the impact of on-tracking on the college pathways of these students. Students were placed into rigorous college, college preparatory classes and enrolled in an AVID elective, which helped to support their success. As you may know, AVID stands for Achievement via Individual Determination, but students did not succeed on their motivation alone. They benefited from a web of school supports provided by their AVID teacher, tutors, and peers in navigating the pathway to college, and they enrolled in college at much higher rates than their non-AVID peers. Ours was the first major study of AVID before it grew from its roots in one teacher's classroom in San Diego to a nationwide program and then internationally. The program has been life-changing for thousands of students and promoted a college-going culture in many schools, and thus there are important equity gains. But what would it take, I wondered, for all students, not just those in a special program, to have such opportunities? This would require that people grapple with their deep-seated beliefs and examine how schools structure any opportunity, often by race and class. Yet these beliefs can come, sometimes go unaddressed when we limit equity reforms to a subset of students in a school. In graduate school at UCLA, I was fortunate to join a nationwide study of racially mixed detracting secondary schools led by my mentors, Jeannie Oakes and Amy Stewart Wells, who is here. This study helped to provide some answers that the earlier study did not. Namely, what dynamics would unfold as educators attempted to implement school-wide reforms that confronted people's ideologies about race, class, and ability, and disrupted patterns of, within school segregation. At the time the study was launched in 1992, there were some schools across the US that were exper experimenting with detracking, often inspired by the work of Jeannie Oakes and others, who had carefully documented the negative effects of tracking, particularly for students who were relegated to low track classes with watered down curricula, less prepared teachers, and low expectations. Groups of reform-minded educators across the country sought to address these conditions, sometimes also inspired by student activism around racial justice. To find schools, our team posted a small advertisement in Education Week, the paper version, asking, teacher, asking educators in detracking school to contact us on the landline for more information. In the end, we focused on 10 schools that we studied longitudinally to capture the change process as it unfolded in real time. To be sure, schools sh shifted structures to allow open access to more rigorous coursework, provided academic supports for students, and experimented with new scheduling arrangements. Challenges arose, however, as not all teachers felt they had the tools to teach heterogeneously grouped classes, and some also felt that not all students had the raw material to be successful in honors and advanced placement courses. An equity question I sought to address involved teachers. I was interested in understanding teacher agency in detracking schools, as it was clear that these teachers, there were teachers who were strong advocates for equity, as well as others who demonstrated more active and passive forms of resistance to detracking. Some white affluent parents of students in high track classes also opposed detracking as they felt their students stood to lose. In some instances, resistant teachers and parents found political allies on school boards. At the end of three years, while all schools had made strides, they were substantially less far along in detracking than I had expected. More significantly, three decades later now, there are relatively few detract secondary schools in the US and the majority continue to track students by perceived ability in spite of a very robust research base showing the negative effects of tracking. This fact is one of the most sobering I've faced in my career. And it says something about the gap between research and practice 
but also about the formidable barriers of equity-driven reforms. Namely, people who hold the power are often unwilling to teach track schools as it would disrupt existing status hierarchies. Courageous leaders who, who wage this fight often face opposition. As we consider how to move forward, we can't only focus on the dynamics existing in high schools or communities they serve, however, without looking at the larger educational system in which they are embedded. Policies, practices, and decisions in the realms of elementary and middle ed school education and higher education shape what's possible in high schools as well. An important element that emerged from the detracking study was a consideration of what it would mean to scale equity-based reforms. While the final report that Oaks and Wells produced included examples of how schools undertake detracking in their context, it was not intended to be a recipe book. Instead, it emphasized focusing on the principles of detracking, namely the need to attend to technical, normative, and political elements of change, rather than focus on simply on replicating structures that other schools had implemented as those would be insufficient. These lessons about how reforms might travel prove useful in examining another type of reform in US education, namely the comprehensive school reform or CSR models that became popular in the late 1980s and into the 2000s. This was a time in American education in which schools had relative autonomy in decision-making about how to organize the core of teaching and learning and often less support from districts in this arena at that time. Yet they were held accountable for results on standardized measures. The models, aimed to be whole school reforms, and they were created by external reform designers based primarily in nonprofit organizations and universities. Along with Sam Stringfield and a host of other colleagues, I had the opportunity to do a deep dive into understanding the implementation and effects of these reforms, examining what they meant for daily life in schools. Again, I asked, what are the equity questions here? When examined with an equity lens, some interesting nuances regarding comprehensive school reform as an educational change approach were revealed. The models varied in terms of their theories of action with some aimed first at changing educators' beliefs with the assumption that this would change their practices and others operating on the reverse. The models also defined the problems of US schooling and the routes to achieving equity in different ways. Success for all aimed to achieve equity through a structured reading program to promote early literacy. The Comer School Development Program was motivated by a concern about students' unmet socio-emotional needs and advocated for designing whole child-focused schools. The Coalition of Essential Schools was very explicit in its commitment to democracy and included equity as a core principle. These models also varied in the extent to which they provided organizing principles around which schools could design their own plans for change or whether they provided fully fleshed out models. Regardless, there was wide variation in implementation due to a combination of factors, including how the reforms were initiated in schools, often a political process, the level of teacher and leader support, and the nature of professional development provided. The patterns of implementation also had consequences for student achievement, which we were able to document through mixed method studies. Some of the most challenging elements that the reform designers faced related to context and scale. And there were important equity questions here as well. Reforms that proved successful in one location sometimes did not adapt well in another serving different student populations and communities. This led educators to make local adaptations in order to fit their students' needs and their own. The co-constructed nature of reform became a hallmark of implementation as people at different levels of the system, which included leaders, teachers, students, parents, and reform designers jointly negotiated what, what reform came to mean in each setting. Moving along, an examination of the data use movement in education, which I prefer to call data informed decision making rather than data driven decision making since data don't drive, provides another lens into how equity, educational reform, and scale intersect. Whereas the comprehensive school reform models were externally developed, data use efforts are often locally developed. Arising from the focus of accountability ushered in by No Child Left Behind in the US and other initiatives across the globe. Data-informed decision-making became increasingly popular over the past two decades. And colleagues and I had the opportunity to study it in many different elementary and secondary school settings. As we engage in this work, we notice that few people were asking equity questions about data use. 
As my colleague Vicki Park and I took a close look at this issue, we found a variety of ways in which data use practices either open or close doors for students. For example, when schools focus largely on accountability and compliance, rather than equity and continuous improvement as their goals for data use, they tend to close doors for students by narrowing the curriculum and focusing on test preparation activities. When educators focus their data use efforts on a small number of students on the cusp of proficiency markers, rather than focusing on improving learning for all students, doors are closed rather than open. Doors are also closed when data are used to confirm rather than challenge assumptions about students and their families. These are not dichotomous practices or decisions, however, as there's a great deal of complexity and nuance in how data are used in schools. Ultimately, schools must be supported in data use that expands students' opportunity to learn and illuminates and eliminates systemic barriers. As the primary setting for data use activities in schools is the teacher team meeting, our studies provided a window into these collaborative spaces involving hundreds of hours of observations. We paid close attention to teacher dialogue. On, as we reflected on the data we were gathering, it was important to again ask, what are the equity questions here? On the positive side, using data to inform decision-making encouraged some teachers to inform, support claims with evidence and examine student growth in more nuanced ways, and the use of data helped them personalize instruction. In this process, some teachers relied on a wide range of data and sought to address their students' needs holistically. In other words, we observed data-informed decision-making as intended. At the same time, we also noticed how the use of data influenced how students were talked about in schools, and these had consequences for equity. In particular, we found that the terms that evolved from accountability systems sometimes became labels for students, my far below basic kids, my proficient kids, not just descriptors of their achievement. Ubiquitously, teachers refer to students as low or high, or sometimes even super low. These labels were relational and comparative and reified a hierarchy of student ability. We also noticed that teachers often assumed a shared understanding of what it meant to be, quote, a typical EL or English learner kid. As we talked with these teachers, we gained more insight into their beliefs about teaching and learning and the students they serve, and many of them shared asset-based thinking in our interviews. This led us to think about how the policy lexicon of accountability systems became a natural part of teacher dialogue, often unwittingly. Looking ahead, it's important for us to be aware of the patterns of how policies and accountability systems shape everyday dialogue in schools, particularly as the language that we use can influence expectations for students. Building awareness of this issue is important, but we must also provide hopeful alternatives, including new language that can become a tool for change. Our observations in teacher team meetings also the, re revealed the ways in which meeting settings functioned as a site for teachers to make sense of the changes underway in their schools. We applied an equity lens to understanding teachers' experiences and collaboration and how they advocated on behalf of their students. For example, in one study, Mimi Lockton, Haley Weddell, and I documented how groups of teachers in some schools labeled low performing advocated for their students. The dilemmas we saw some teachers grapple with revealed not only equity questions, but ethical ones as well. Some teachers felt caught in a bind between providing data for administrative purposes and what they felt was best for students, whom they felt were over-tested with assessments that were not suitable for informing instruction. Issues of fairness also came up in dialogues about class placement. What serves the interests of one group may not serve the interests of another. We found it instructive to use an ethics and equity framework that could be applied to un unpacking decision-making in schools. Drawing upon the work of numerous authors, this framework called upon us to consider who held the power in decision-making, who were the silenced voices, who would benefit and who would stand to lose. Ultimately, are these decisions fair and for whom? In our work, we argue that these kinds of questions could be applied not only for research, but also by educators and schools as they're seeking a path forward for particularly challenging decisions that have consequences for students, since they help to illuminate some of the power differentials in decision-making. Notably, it often becomes clear that the students, and in some communities, the parents, are silent voices in decision-making. As we, applying this lens helped us see the ways in which equity and ethics were closely intertwined in everyday interactions. It also reinforced how interdependent contextual levels are in school reform, and decisions made, made in one domain, such as the central office, 
can have positive intentions, but raise an anticipated equity and ethical dilemmas in the classroom. The extensive time my colleagues and I have spent studying school change has also illuminated the emotional dimensions of reform, particularly reforms that involve disrupting patterns of inequality. Again, it's helpful to ask, what are the equity questions here? Early on in my dissertation work, the fight over whose definition of school would prevail was emotional and political for educators involved. And this particular battle was fought along gender grounds. Although the topic of emotions was the focus of numerous educational change studies decade, maybe a decade ago, particularly internationally, it has received limited attention since. Meanwhile, it is clear that emotions must be examined as engaging in change, particularly change oriented towards social justice involves a great deal of emotional labor. We have learned through our work that educators don't just emote individually, they emote collectively in their work settings, in their grade level teams, in their departments, and so on. Sometimes the collective work itself brings on a set of emotions. Teachers co can find collaborative spaces to be sources of support and promoting equity in their schools, or they can find them to be sites of frustration. We found that teachers experience stress in collaborative settings when they lack sufficient time, couldn't get on the same page, or felt under the microscope. Teachers in these schools under pressures to improve experience more stress and anguish over being surveilled in their meeting settings and in their classrooms. As one teacher said, the stress levels are high this week. Another commented on their exhaustion. Of course, site administrators were also held accountable by district administrators who have implemented directives with the goal of supporting coherence and school improvement. Principals often express positive emotions related to reforms that they initiated, particularly if they felt these reforms would open doors for students. New administrators often arrived with a sense of excitement and joy about how they were able to mobilize energy, and then conversely, some challenges when they encountered barriers. Understanding educators' emotions in the context of reform is now more important than ever, as they play a pivotal role in transforming schools and helping their students understand the complexity of the world around them. Ultimately, the emotions of educators in schools undergoing reform are not only individual, but social and political as well. In the end, as we reflect upon what we've learned, when we ask equity questions and studies of school reform, we are left with much work to do. That is, we see various instances of deep-seated belief systems that undermine efforts to create more equitable schools and systems. We need to address these beliefs and reform if we are to have a meaningful impact. We've also learned that equity-focused reforms that seek to disrupt school patterns of inequality must involve close attention to power and political dimensions. Attending to context and how educators co-construct reform is also essential. We still struggle with scaling school reforms from one school to many. We also see how compliance-oriented systems can stymie improvement efforts and influence how students are labeled in schools as an unanticipated consequence. Moreover, as teachers advocate on behalf of their students, equity concerns can raise ethical questions as well. Not surprisingly, educators encounter emotions and reform that are at once individual, social, and political. These lessons are by no means exhaustive. They would also not surprise anyone who's been studying equity and reform. But they're especially important if we are to be mindful of now as we try to reimagine schools for the future. And yet I still feel a sense of hopefulness that perhaps we can reinvent school systems in ways that support the talent and well being of all young people. As we begin to emerge from the global pandemic, hopefully, and schools attempt to engage in fundamental change, what might be the role of education researchers? Asking equity questions will be important, but shifts in the way we do our work will also be essential if we are to play a constructive role. These shifts will allow us to accompany our critiques with hope and a quest for solutions. In considering how education re researchers might think differently about their work going forward, I will focus on three areas, research practice partnerships, training the next generation of scholars and building bridges across various domains. As I will explain, focusing on each of these topics is important if we're to make significant headway in both understanding the intersection of equity and educational change and gaining traction on some of the challenges I outlined above. In recent years, I've shifted much of my work to the domain of research practice partnerships, which is one form of more engaged research. 
There is growing community of scholars who are involved in RPPs and RPPs have gained considerable attention and support from notable foundations, including Spencer and WT Grant. Important publications have documented the characteristics of well-functioning RPPs and proposed ways to evaluate their effectiveness. We are also increasingly learning about how RPPs operate on the ground as researchers, practitioners, students, and community members join to address pressing educational problems. Why might RPPs offer hope in, per in the pursuit of equity and educational reform? In addition to the issues I described earlier, the disconnect between research and practice provides one answer to why some educational practices have persisted despite a strong research base documenting their ill effects. While not a panacea, RPPs offer a partial solution. For a number of years, several colleagues, Alison Wishard Guerra, Shauna Cohen, and faculty in the neurosciences, and a group of graduate students, and I have been involved in a RPP with the Vista Unified School District here in San Diego. We have had a long relationship with this innovative district and have regular and formal interaction with administrators, co lead councils, participate in strategic planning, among other activities. In keeping with the tennis of RPPs and the recommendations of the new National Academy report on the future of IES, the research we are undertaking in the district is oriented around their concerns, not ours. A current priority in the district is improving early education. Over a period of months, we learned about teachers pressing questions in this domain. Teachers had questions about a wide range of issues, including how they might best support the, the learning of students from multilingual families and how trauma in the community is affecting students' learning and well being. The nature of RPP work offers hope and promise in addressing equity concerns in real time in ways that traditional models may not. In collaboration with teachers, our team co-designed a project to better understand students' development across home and school, and importantly, to use this knowledge to improve the education for young children in the district. A key component of this work is a teacher-researcher collaborative, a meeting, a regular ongoing meeting in which, with educators in which we jointly make sense of project data and consider the pedagogical and also policy implications. We as researchers have tremendous privilege to learn alongside our K-12 partners whom we do research with rather than research on. We must be continually attentive to the power dynamic involved in our positionality as university researchers. A critical element of RPP work is to gather data on the RPP itself and how it is functioning. There are challenges such as analyzing data in a timely manner so it can be shared with our partners. Meanwhile, teachers rightly consider an urgent problem as something that has to be addressed imminently in their classrooms. Moreover, continually finding resources to support a durable partnership is an, is an ongoing issue as timelines for proposal development often don't cohere with the imperative to be attentive to local needs. Working in an RPP also requires the flexibility to pivot as it did in the pandemic to shifting conditions. It also requires the ability to work at multiple levels of the system as we consider how to scale our efforts. While RPPs offer important hope with respect to equity, there is more to do on this front. We would be wise to learn from our colleagues who are using decolonizing methodologies and engaging in community-based community -based participatory research. Above all, our research needs to support communities, not extract from them. If we are to shift the paradigm, to engage forms of research in which researchers more, partner more closely with practitioners, policymakers, and community members to address equity issues in educational change, we will also need to consider how we train future scholars. Many of us were not prepared to do this kind of work and made the shift after our careers were established. PhD programs in education have historically focused on training future researchers who conduct research in ways that are separate from the lives of their participants. The knowledge of how to form and sustain long-term partnerships, organize research around practitioners' interests, and generate products that, that are suitable beyond a research audience are not typically a part of PhD education. That said, many of our phenomenal students come to us as former education practitioners who fought for social justice, and some have experiences and skills that are particular assets in RPP work, such as community organizing, political advocacy and leading change. What might it look like for PhD programs to not only value and nurture these skills, but to actively recruit for them in the ways that we more routinely look for prior research experience? <laughs>
at UC San Diego, we're attempting to train the next generation of scholars in a different way in a PhD program we call Transforming Education in a Diverse Society. This photo is of our highly talented inaugural cohort in 2016, and many of our other students are here. In this program, we attempt to model for students how we work side by side with community members. There are more than a dozen active RPP projects that students can engage with with a range of partners, including schools, districts, policy and community groups, and colleges. One facilitating factor is that the department has had a long standing positive relationships with local school systems and a commitment to practice. San Diego also happens to be a hotbed for educational innovation, allowing for the exploration of myriad models of change and an opportunity for collective transformation, as my colleagues and I discussed in a session this morning. This work is not limited to the region, however, as faculty and students are also involved in partnerships in much more distant locations. Our hope is that students will take this model of engaged research with them when they graduate, adapt it to, to their local circumstances, and continue to do work that has national or international significance. While training students for educational research that authentically engages people in communities provides hope in the pursuit of equity, it is not without its challenges. The reward structures in universities in some cases have yet to support this kind of work. The extensive time required to initiate and sustain partnerships may not always be recognized. It's, upon, it's incumbent upon those of us who train the next generation of researchers to pave the way, to, to break some of these barriers, to model how to publish this work, and to invite junior scholars to participate in field building activities and edited volumes and special issues. The new foundational handbook of improvement research is one such example, and it includes a particular focus on the implications of equity. If we are to achieve hopefulness with respect to equity, we also need to examine not only how and with whom we're doing the work, but also the theories and disciplines that we draw on. Within AERA, a large and complex organization, educators are often siloed into their subfields. This serves as a barrier as the knowledge needed to understand educational change that centers equity is not nested within a single subdiscipline. In a recent paper, my former and current students, Mariko Yoshisato, Brandy McDonald, Ben Kennedy, Jessica Trejos and I have called for bridging work within our scholarly community. In particular, we argue that it would be useful to link scholars who have knowledge on educational reform with scholars who have knowledge on how to create more equitable, anti-racist and decolonized spaces for learners. While many educational change scholars are deeply concerned about promoting equity, a serious consideration of what it would take to create, scale and sustain the anti-racist and decolonized, decolonial educational practices that many in the field have called for has typically not been a focus. These scholarly communities rarely intersect. Researchers in these different domains do not occupy the same spaces at AERA, nor do they collaborate within their institutions. As my colleagues and I argue, a failure to connect these knowledge bases would constitute a missed opportunity to bring transformational changes, those that confront traditional power relations around race, class, and gender, to a larger number of individuals and organizations engaged in the educational process. However, increased knowledge sharing between scholarly communities will only go so far. We must extend collaboration into communities, as I noted earlier. Moreover, we need to extend our examination of educational change beyond the formal structures of schools and systems, as the young people we're focused on supporting often move fluidly between formal and informal learning spaces in our communities. Thus, our research should cross these domains as well. Linkages across knowledge bases need to not only happen within the field of education and, our, and with our partners, but also beyond it. Many education researchers represent dis different disciplines. How often, how, bleh, however, we don't often extend outside the social sciences. Yet it's quite likely that some solutions to vexing educational problems, such as the overlap between health and education disparities are found at the intersection of typically distant communities. We must find ways to cross disciplinary boundaries and form bridges with scholars in our field, in other fields, so we can support equity in a more multifaceted way. Yet there are numerous challenges to cross disciplinary collaboration, including publishing in different venues, seeking funding from different sources, and having different types of fo foci in our work. While many universities recognize the importance of interdisciplinary work, the infrastructures may not support it yet. Cross-disciplinary hires are notoriously challenging and faculty pursuing research across units may bump up against bureaucratic constraints. If over time, 
the structures and cultures of our professional worlds allowed us to work more fluidly across disciplinary boundaries, we may have more success finding solutions to some of the equity problems in education and beyond. In addition to building bridges across disciplines, we also need to cross international borders if we are to provide hope in achieving equity. The US has historically been internally focused on its search for solutions to educational problems. Education researchers in the US often focus mainly on the work of other US researchers with limited attention to international scholars in our syllabi and in our publications. Scholars outside the, the US are rarely invited to consult on education policy development in the US, whereas some other countries regularly invite experts beyond their borders to provide insights. Meanwhile, it is quite clear that the knowledge needed to address equity concerns in education do not lie only in the US or in any one country. During pandemic school closures around the world, educators and policymakers were paying close attention to what was happening in other countries as schools navigated these difficult circumstances. The time is now for us to build on this momentum to bridge international boundaries and learn how systems across the globe are reimagining education in ways that serve the needs of all students and their holistic selves. As we undertake this work, it'll be important to examine how systems around the globe define equity and how equity concerns are centered in their change efforts. A group of colleagues, Vicki Park, Don Perek, Jim Spallan, and I are embarking on a project that we hope will capture some lessons on this front. As we emerge from the global pandemic, our lives, our institutions, and our communities, our research sites have profoundly changed in ways that we have not yet fully documented. During the same period, we've also witnessed increased energy to address persistent systemic racism. However, I fear we are at risk of slipping back into longstanding routines. We must continue to press for racial justice and also fight for those who continue to be disenfranchised as a result of their native language, national origin, gender, and or sexual identity. However, as Bell Hooks explains, if all we do is critique, we take away hope and empowerment. What new equity questions must we, might, must we ask? How do we embed hope in our research? This is an auspicious moment to root our struggle in hope as I've never seen an opening like we have now to do things differently. At the same time, we're in a fragile moment in education in the US as we're struggling to recruit and retain teachers and administrators. Meanwhile, many students in our schools are struggling and in need of academic and, and socio-emotional support in order to cultivate their talents and well-being after a very difficult two plus years. Our systems will need to shift significantly in order to enable schools to be places where young people and educators can thrive. To be useful partners in solving these educational problems requires deeply how we as researchers do our work. We need to consider not only how we move research forward, but how we move, push the field forward in policy and practice. Our work needs to do more than validate. It needs to empower us and our partners towards a new and different future. I welcome the opportunity to hear from you about the possibilities for hope that you see going forward. Thank you. We have some time for questions. If you have questions, I'll start with one because it's something I've been wrestling with myself. I was really um, glad to see you talk about hope and the importance of hope. How do you wrestle with the tension between that holding hope and how dismal things are and the fact that we seem to be headed in the wrong direction in a lot of places around equity and, and, and nationally with our discourse, with the policies, with the everything that's happening right now, um, how do you how do you reconcile that? That's a really tough one, and so I mean I know it's hope's been it's come up as a theme in numerous different settings here at ARA. I think the the hard part for me is you know reconciling reconciling those, but also um, challenging myself to think about what might we do differently. I think that's the the place where I think we can hold ourselves to a. Uh, um, a new standard as researchers to really give, in, in addition to providing the critiques like I outlined, but also give some people some new tools for change. I think it's really incumbent upon us to think deeply about what can we, if we critique something, what can we suggest that might be different here? Because it's, you know, th these critiques are all really carefully documented, but on the one hand, it is easy to make them. And yet we oftentimes don't then provide a, 
some next steps on what might be different, how might we move with work with partners and creating a, a different reality or introducing something new that might be useful. And I don't mean a, you know, kind of a new curriculum or new approach to change, but even new language, new ways of thinking. So I think that piece of kind of holding ourselves to the policy and practical implications of our work could provide one vehicle, but it is, you know, it is indeed, you know, a, a difficult time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I'd love you. to hear if you have thoughts too. Well, I mean, I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. Like the, it's not, um, I've been thinking about it as the, as the habits of our field. What are our research habits? Mm -hmm. And I think the habit in equity work to lead with critique and thus seed our own power mm -hmm. is a really strong one. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I agree with you. It's really important to think about how do we not seed power? How do we actually lean into our power collectively and individually? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Questions. There's a mic in the middle of the room if you want to walk up and ask a question. I know we haven't been together in many years and we're used to that Zoom situation where you just are kind of a passive ingester of things, but we, we get to be together. So if there's a question or a comment or thoughts or things that appeal to you, I'm going to ask your mom to ask something in a second. Where's your mom? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the words. I was thinking about your suggestion of working more across disciplines, and I was I do some of that work as well. And I, there, there are some real benefits to that, but there are also some some roadblocks or some pitfalls. There are some a power symmetries as we look at other disciplines in education. So I'm just wondering if you could talk more about how to navigate those waters and consider that because. We do have a different sort of way of thinking about learning and power and research and ethics. Thank you. That's definitely something I'm familiar with. And it's interesting, um, you know, we're fortunate to be involved in this research practice partnership that I explained. And one aspect of the partnership is collaborating with um, neuroscientists. And it's really interesting seeing how educators and schools see us in, in different kinds of ways, because the idea of studying the brain is really fascinating to people. And somehow there's a sense that this knowledge about the brain is, you know, as you said, there are different asymmetries even between the research done by neuroscientists and research done by educators. Um, we also approach the work, you know, quite differently because, you know, our, our partners are very mindful that we have more experience in dealing in the practice domain. And that I think is something that, that educators uniquely bring. Much of the work that we do is involved with deep thinking about how adult learners learn, how, you know, young people learn and so on. So I think that that's a, an asset that we bring to that work even though we exist in a space where education may um, not be at the top of the disciplinary hierarchy with those we collaborate with at times. And hopefully one has partners, you know, who are mindful about those dynamics and so on and share the same kinds of um, understandings that you do. But I think it's, it's one of those things we naturally fall into, even if our partners don't reinforce those, you know? Yeah. Yeah, come on up, okay. ask your question. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was curious to hear more about um, the study that you did on detracking and that you found that few schools had actually detracked. If you could just talk more about that, like why do you think that happened that despite the, the data that was available, that detracking was not implemented? Well, um, so this study was now, gosh, it's been almost 30, 30 years. Some people in the audience were part of that work. and. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we found is that there's formative, normative, and political barriers to detracking in addition to just the structural ones. And so one can, you know, create new ways of scheduling and, you know, place students in the classrooms in different ways. But ultimately, those changes also bump up against people's belief systems and the politics and power relations that hold those in place. And so um, I think I, I'm still genuinely surprised in a lot of ways that this many years later, we don't have more detracting in schools. I was, I thought we were on the cusp of a revolution back in the nineties and Neela was at UCLA at the time too. And um, Amy Wells is here. And so, but that's, that's not where we went, um, unfortunately. And I think, you know, there are a host of kind of policy reasons why those, you know, um, those systems are still in place as well. And I think those need to be looked at in addition to the political will that is not there in a lot of places. Um, those of you will recognize who were here in San Diego, just in our newspaper in the past week, there was a school that was trying to do away with some um, of their higher tech classes and got a whole lot of community backlash. And so it's just, it's a very difficult um, battle to wage. And, and some people aren't 
you know, don't feel like it's sustainable to fight that. But I think as long as universities reward a particular kind of set of course taking patterns, it's very hard for high schools to change and do something differently. At the same time, if we're not preparing students in ways so that they're all ready for rigorous instruction as they move through the grades, that's an additional challenge. And so in the work that we're doing in this partner district, they're trying, um, the superintendent would say that his goal is to try, close the achievement gap before it opens. So intervene really early in students' lives so that students have access to rigorous instruction at an early age and so that they're all ready for um, you know, rigorous instruction as they move through the grades, rather than what we see as, you know, Jeannie Oakes would talk about relatively small differences at the, at the early years grow much wider as students are exposed to different kinds of content. And so, you know, the work really needs to start early on and making those learning settings robust so that, you know, all students are ready for whatever pathways they're interested in. Yeah, I have a, a funny personal story about detracking actually. So my high school English teacher had read Jeannie Oakes's mm -hmm. book and was taking a course with, I wanna say Judith Warren Little or someone at Berkeley and had made the move to detrack AP English my senior year. So I was a part of this first kind of experimental cohort of AP English being detracked. And it was by, by most metrics, hugely successful. But what happened and what happened as you all have documented is that the white parents come out in mass to protest this. So I feel like the detracking literature is in some ways this, um, this emblematic thing about what happens when you find a reform that actually works for equity. What happens is people who hold privilege go out against that reform because, and, and, and they're, because this is about power, right? Like this is about white communities holding on to power through these normative practices that we've all gotten used to. So it, it, it was an interesting, it's interesting work in, from my perspective to want to have, have experienced it personally and then to have seen that, that backlash by white parents, mostly white and privileged parents to say, these structures work for us. No, don't touch mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yes, question. Hi, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I learned a lot about your work and I heard a lot of wonderful things about you as well. So thank you very much. But this, seg this um, conversation really segues into what I was wondering because I saw that you used bell hooks as you know, a, a payment, um, point makers in what you were saying. And I'm wondering how do you use um, equity? You talk about equity um, in your research, but I don't see a lot of crossover in using black ethnographic or you know, epistemological research being a part of the conversation. So how do you intersect that to make sure that your data set is including the people that you're trying to actually impact? That's a really excellent point. And I think that you, what you speak to is exactly the kind of cross-disciplinary work that we need to be doing um, within our within the field of education. I think that's an essential element. I can imagine, you know, and I do know some of the work that um, people do using black epistemological frameworks that, um, you know, can be really illuminating in understanding the very issues we've talked about. I think that what, what I am um, trying to argue is in addition to doing that work, we then need to, you know, also think about what have we learned about scale and so on? So when we see some really, let's say, exciting work happening in, in a school or in one teacher's classroom, what can we learn about educational change that can bring us to an understanding of scaling that amazing work up to a larger level? And it's, it's really the intersection of those communities that becomes really important. I think um, those frameworks we use and choose are critical in how we do this work. And I think that um, I would welcome the opportunity for kind of more conversations on that front, on the very different ways in which we can start to um, imagine this work because it really is, it's, it's where we need to go. So you've, you've hit the nail on the head for sure. With Thank implications you. for research training as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Implications for research training. Thank you. Do we have one, one last question from the audience? Yeah. Amy. And then I'm short. <laughs> Um, thank you, Amanda, for such an inspirational presentation. I have some question. I don't know if you have answered to it, but so interdisciplinary correlation is really important, but sometimes other people in other fields have different understanding of social justice equity issues or belief is different. And then I sometimes feel like I'm just hitting the block, like brick wall. What, do, what would you suggest to do to communicate, to have a mutual understanding of what needs to be done to move forward and making changes in the field of education? Thank you. 
Thank you for that question, Amy. And I know you work in computer science, which is um, a really important field for us to be thinking about. I think, um, you know, one thing that I think could be helpful is, is having a, making time for those deep conversations about how do you define equity in your field? Um, what are the equity goals in this project? How can we flesh those out together? Because I think, um, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for misunderstandings when time isn't allowed for those deep conversations and to get into the researchers own deep seated beliefs, because we also know within these subdisciplines, they have different kind of equity issues and demands as the scholars themselves find their way through those professions. And so um, I think it's really important to understand those and people's own experiences with um, with racism, with, you know, classism, with, um, you know, many other forms of oppression and try to understand how those connect to the mission and their work. So, you know, it's easy for us to sort of go down the road and get quickly going on the project piece um, without really kind of taking a step back and saying, you know, let's dig into our own belief systems about equity in our own personal experiences. Yeah, great. Well, please join me in thanking Amanda for this wonderful presentation. Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.